When you look at the film of Saturn V launches where you can see the nozzles up close, the exhaust forms a dark band immediately below the nozzle extensions, burning through a colossal volume of kerosene to lift the rocket's massive 3 million kilogram weight off the ground. Soon, the first stage shuts off, separated, allowing a second stage to roar into life, this time powered by a different fuel, liquid hydrogen, a fuel capable of providing better performance, but it occupied too much space. NASA engineers couldn't feasibly make the Saturn V first stage fuel tank any larger, so liquid hydrogen was not an option. The science of rocket fuel is a fascinating, complicated field, combining just not physics and chemistry and engineering, but also logistics. That's the challenge facing SpaceX as it develops the next generation of heavy lift rockets, designed to take us not just to the moon, but further to Mars. This is SpaceX's genius solution to use a new fuel that will change everything. With the goal of colonizing Mars, the biggest concern for Elon Musk is fuel. It's all about trade-offs. Every extra pound of cargo that a rocket needs to lift off the surface of Earth requires more fuel, while every new bit of fuel adds weight to the rocket. And weight becomes an even bigger factor when trying to get a spaceship somewhere as far away as Mars, land there, and come back again. Accordingly, mission designers have to be as judicious and efficient as possible when figuring out what to pack on a ship headed for space and which rockets to use. And kerosene and hydrogen, they're not perfect. The truth is that both hydrogen and kerosene have pluses and minuses. Hydrogen carries more energy per mass, so a hydrogen-burning rocket will, in theory, have a higher final payload for the same amount of fuel burned. But hydrogen's lower density means you'll have a higher dry mass for the same amount of fuel carried because your tanks need to be larger and more heavily insulated. Hydrogen-burning engines also have lower thrust-to-weight and thrust-to-nozzle size than kerosene does, so you end up needing larger engines and you can lose more energy due to gravity and aerodynamic losses in the early parts of the flight trying to lift that gigantic rocket off the ground. In theory, a more optimized rocket would have a high-density fuel like kerosene for the lower stage where high thrust is most critical, and a higher efficiency fuel like hydrogen for the upper stage where efficiency matters most. But it's desirable to have the same fuel for the upper and lower stage as it simplifies operational consideration. SpaceX has optimized its design for easy operation and put much effort into making a really robust first stage that could be reused over and over. The second stage is actually a relatively inefficient design, but at least it's cheap. The Delta IV Heavy is optimized for efficiency at the cost of expensive ground handling equipment due to the sheer size of the first stage. For Starship, SpaceX is switching to methane, which as fuel is somewhere between hydrogen and kerosene. Let's make some comparisons. The first couple, methane versus kerosene or RP-1. As an intended plan of in situ fuel production, methane could be manufactured on Mars via the saboteur process, which will be helpful to refuel the rocket. Now that's vital to SpaceX's goal of regular trips to and from Mars with Starship, allowing it to be almost self-sufficient in terms of fuel. This has been the holy grail of solar system access for humanity, says Garcia, because when you can refuel in space, now all of a sudden your propellant doesn't have to come from Earth. Methane has a bit more specific impulse, 370S, than kerosene at 360S, in a vacuum at the same chamber pressure with a reference value of 7 MPa but this is counterbalanced by RP-1's lower bulk density, which is the density of fuel plus oxygen. Although the density of methane is 430 kilograms per meter squared, it needs 3.5 parts of oxygen compared to 2.1 for RP-1. Hence, the methane engine will carry less fuel, but more oxygen by weight, about 20% larger tank than RP-1. Coke formation temperature for methane is approximately double as high in the rocket chamber that supports the reusability of vehicles, while RP-1 produces a chain of carbon and shoot particles that degrades the reusability of the rocket. Now let's look at methane versus liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen is a popular first stage ignition with a specific impulse of approximately 350 to 540 S. This has also been used as a second and further stage propellant if RP-1 was used as first stage. 
Liquid hydrogen technology was considered a very important achievement by NASA because of the challenge of its cryogenic characteristics that requires extreme care to handle that liquid at about 423 degrees Fahrenheit. But now the production of methane doubles every decade. External energy is not required, so methane does not need active cooling while passive cooling will work. While testing hydrogen propellants, considerable failure in components has occurred due to the process called hydrogen embrittlement, various contact between gaseous hydrogen molecules and metal components at the temp range of minus 260 centigrade to more than 2000 centigrade creates uncertainty in the brittle character of the used component. Various metal hydrides are also producing a critical problem. Expansive and laborious wall treatment of components can be avoided in the case of methane. Hydrogen turbo pumps are more complex than methane turbo pumps, which reduces complications in the plumbing of the fuel. And you know, SpaceX wants their rocket to be simple and reliable. According to Elon Musk, the best part is no part, the best process is no process. One main factor that must be mentioned, cost. SpaceX is a for-profit company, so cost matters a lot. Methane has become a lot cheaper recently. The price of natural gas declined quite a lot due to technological advances in production, such as fracking. This made methane the cheapest rocket fuel. As of 2001, NASA was paying 98 cents a gallon for liquid hydrogen, which equates to about 16 MMBTU, which is much more expensive than LNG nowadays. Starship uses 1,200 tons of propellant and Super Heavy about 3,300 tons, so that's 4,500 in total. 3.55 tons of liquid oxygen for every one ton of liquid methane, 3,510 tons of LOX versus 989 tons of LCH4. Elon described oxygen as almost free. Now, this is a future state statement where SpaceX will make massive solar-powered oxygen capturing and liquefaction systems. LOX is $40 a metric ton to distill from the air. $240,000 for 200,000 kilograms of the payload is about $1.20 per kilogram or about 50 cents per pound. If SpaceX reduces the cost with the direct production of liquid oxygen and production of methane from natural gas, they can reduce fueling costs by half to about 60 cents per kilogram or about 30 cents per pound of payload. Labor and other non-fuel costs will be vastly lower for the SpaceX Starship because of the massively lower initial cost, limiting financing and interest costs because of vastly higher speed for more users each day. Fueling costs start out about even, but SpaceX can lower costs by producing their own liquid oxygen and having involvement in making the methane. The fuel for a SpaceX Starship will move more cargo. In conclusion, using methane as a fuel provides a great environmental benefit, producing more heat and more light energy by mass, but cheaper compared to the others. Only one thing, let's hope this new fuel works well on the Starship. And that about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section below. Your support is motivation for us to create more quality content. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.